So, hi and welcome to the final stretch of the symposium. Um, I'm very happy to be able to talk with, in a couple of minutes, with Johanna Kuljonen, um, one of the most brilliant minds, at least in my opinion, um, if it comes to um, people having a clear view of the near future and what it means for the industry and with the industry in that case for the media industry as a whole but especially for the European TV industry, for the European film industry. And um, we will dive with her in a, in a talk that will put some of the things that we've seen and heard in the last um, couple of sessions into a little bit more perspective. Um, to set the stage a little bit and to pick up some of the points that were yesterday evening mentioned in the panel that that we um, that we had here with Dave McKean and Boris and, and Erwin and Jochen, um, I think it might be interesting to um, make um, to pick up some of the points and um, pave the path to what we'll talk about with um, with Johanna. Um, I want to start with something that um, that also puts maybe some of those questions of um, what is original, what can AIs do, what can generative AIs do, a little bit more into context um, with something like this. Um, I think most of you might have seen it already. Um, it's not very new or fresh, um, but I find it amusing nevertheless. Um, it's from Demon Flying Fox, um, creator who mostly is um, is on YouTube, um, who creates or churns out um, remixes of famous stories and IPs in an amazing rate. I think he has a few dozens of those out there, and most of you will know this in one form or another. Another. Um, this is um, the movie Joker, um, done as a um, comedy, as a French um, movie from the 80s. Je n'ai plus rien à perdre, plus rien ne peut me faire du mal. Ma vie n'est qu'une comédie. Avez-vous des idées noires en ce moment? Tout ce que j'ai, c'est des idées noires. épouvantable ces jours-ci. C'est suffisant pour rendre tout le monde fou. Et honnêtement, je pense que nous pourrions tous utiliser un bon rire. Alors, veuillez accueillir le Joker. I think you get the idea a little bit. And I think there are a lot of them out there, um, out there. Uh, most of them interesting enough with Wes Anderson, um, like Wes Anderson doing Lord of the Rings, Wes Anderson doing Star Wars, Wes Anderson doing anything you can imagine. Uh, with the more most running gag is always Timothy Chalamet playing the main character, the main lead. Um, what I find so interesting about this is not so far the content itself, uh, but what it shows a little bit about how generative AI works. And I think um, this is something that might be interesting to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> When looking at most of this generative AIs, and it doesn't matter if it's Midjourney, ChatGPT, any kind of large language model, or as we learned um, yesterday, the Golem models that um, that are multi-model models that take a lot of um, corpus of data and turn it into something new. It can turn out by itself. It's mostly based always on this on the same on the same mode of working. Um, this is mostly this pattern recognition, like having a huge corpus of data and recognizing a set of rules within it. Like recognizing, for example, that in French movies, you have like this a certain kind of visual style. So that if I input it into mid midpoint and I can go, go give me something on a nouvelle vague um, visual style, it puts out this. This is because it recognizes a pattern and 
then creates, and this is uh, the, the point at least that I find so fascinating, it never understands exactly what, what this pattern means, but it sees that this kind of pattern works in a certain probability. And then it can reproduce that kind of pattern. I think, at least for me, this is always helpful when looking at all those different kinds of generative AI that are out there, that most of them, and not only the generative AI, also the curative AI, that it's mostly about recognizing a pattern, um, being able to predict the probability that is um, this is weighted in the, inside that pattern, and then being able to reproduce that pattern. I think this is something that shows very clearly and you see how ChatGPT works. I think I know that most of you might already know this. Um, I just want to point it out again because for me it's also um, something that's fascinating without end. Um, that this is the probability curve if you give in the sentence um, AI um, is the perfect machine to Dot, dot, dot. And now, um, please, um, ChatGPT, um, continue that sentence. Um, it looks through all the patterns, uh, it looks through all the data it has and has like a certain kind of pattern that it will recognize there. And this is like the weighted distribution curve on what word will come next in that chain of probability. And this is, AI is very good at um, being able to learn, predict, make, understand, do, and so on. Um, what I find a real fascinating point here is the moment you take the most probable outcome as the next sentence or the next word in the sentence, um, most of the time, in about 95% of the cases, AI goes into like a loop. It like creates sentences that as us as a reader don't make sense and that go like in a circular loop and that doesn't make sense for you to read it. So most of the time you have to find like a weighted average that's somewhere there in between the second and third and sometimes the fourth choice and only then it flows into like a like a like a chain of probability that you as a user if you read it it makes sense to you. This I find so interesting and again bearing in mind that not the machine makes gives it sense or makes it makes it makes it sensible for us but us as someone who uses it who looks at a certain kind of of pattern and recognizes this pattern and it connects to something in us this may be going back to this whole um, talk about what part of it is um, is actually the machine and what is coming from us as humans and what kind of interaction do we offer it um, the second point I want to make when um, looking at a lot of the stuff that we've seen in the in the last few days. Um, some of the feedback that I heard is, like, yeah, but it still looks really machine-made and it still doesn't look that great and it's still not quite there to rival anything that we would use for, for normal film. Um, this is also a friend of mine who works I can't in hear that you. field. I, I, yes, okay, okay, I can hear you. All right. Uh all right. <laughs> um, this is something that um, here um, he always points out is that um, we are moving at our exponential curve. That means most of humans have a real problem to imagine what exponential growth means because we mostly mean exponential is just a very, very steep um, growth in terms of, of linear levels. What this means in terms of that it's accelerating and is accelerating by, by a factor that's much faster than that we can imagine is something that I find always helpful to keep in mind because right now the technology is there to replicate itself in a very fast rate because we have like a unified field of AI. What before was like speech recognition, image recognition, all the different, different kind of fields since a few years back. Um, there was a very famous paper done by a Google um, researcher. Um, it's unified into, you can say, a, a one field. So um, if anybody makes advances in, for example, um, combining DNA in a better way, those, um, those machine learnings um, also will help someone who to generate better images. This is all in a very basic and superficial um, term that we're talking about, but I think that always helps to bear in mind that this is moving as a fa at a fast rate. And this is what we found out when talking about this in the last few, in the, in the last year, that sometimes um, if you're not on top of the topic for two or three months, it feels like you have, you missed a generation. Um, this win. Oops. 
Uh, one of the last points um, I want to make a little bit because it popped up yesterday um, is this, um, what does it mean for um, for us as creatives, for us as a society? And this is what we what I will definitely talk about with Johanna um, in, a, in a short while. Um, this here fire your photographer was the claim on a um, on a website that offered to give you stock image of humans like you could say i want to have um an asian person um wearing a tank top in front of um a nice forest landscape and it could deliver you that in a matter of seconds and here that's a little bit weird and uh, this was like the claim on top of their web page for a couple of days. It's like fire a photographer because you won't need him anymore. What we can do, we can do it for a little bit less of the money and we could do it for a little bit less of the time. Um, they quickly changed this. So if you go now on the, on the, on the side of the, of the web page of the service, this is no longer there. I took a screenshot back there because I thought this is like the dilemma we will be facing. And that has only been um, touched upon a little bit in the last few days um, in terms of what does it mean for people who are working in the industry and who are trying to break in the industry. Um, will there be enough work? What kind of work will it be? And what kind of skill sets do you need to succeed in that kind of field? Um, because keeping in mind, and I don't want to go so much into the points down there, but I want to make a, a point that goes into this direction a little bit. Um, yesterday there were like talks about the yeah people um, we talk with at Netflix and HBO they're not that interested in in AI right now. Um, I can assure you, I talked with people from um, from Netflix from Warner five years ago, and in at South by Southwest and they were already heavily invested in that topic. So these people are for the last five years trying to leverage how they can use that kind of technology. Um, they're just not doing it openly because as you've seen with the writer's strike, right now there is like an advantage. Who knows more how these machines work and what they can do has a big advantage um, 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 in relation to the people who don't know how exactly the technology works and what it can do. Um, looking at something like this, what in the last two years happened to some of the biggest media companies, I think it's important to bear in mind that in that kind of market situation, anybody who has the choice to do something of a similar quality for a more inexpensive price, and this is what I meant at the beginning where I say, can you afford to not use a technology? And that not only goes on the personal level, but on a company level, on a, on a society-wide level. It's like in such a, if you're looking at these numbers and you have like shareholder value that you have to, to bear in mind. And I'm not talking about public broadcasters who might have another mindset, but if you have a shareholder value and shareholders who will like say, why did you spend 15 million on that kind of movie? We, we, we know that it can be done now for um, 50,000. I think this is something that, bear in mind, that these kind of economical pressures um, will trickle down to, to the field we're working in. I don't want to terrify you in any way. I'm just saying that, bear in mind, that um, the economical realities have always informed the kind of movies that we do. And this might be, um, might be interesting bearing in mind. Um, and I also, I skipped two slides that are not relevant right here. Um, and I also want to bear this a little bit in mind. These are the people right now in correlation a little bit. On the right, you have the current market ca cap of some of the biggest media companies, so Comcast, Netflix, Disney. And on the left, you have the biggest tech companies. Here you have the market cap added in one year, 2023. So that means that, for example, Meta added in terms of value, the whole value of the biggest three media companies in just one year. Um, to give a little bit more correlation on what this adaptation of AI as a technology means as an economical factor, it's like the day Microsoft announced that it was incorporating AI into 
its office suit, the market cap grew the size of BMW. So the whole value of BMW was added the moment that they said they're going to use AI and something like this. And this is something that we've seen if you look at the stock market and some of the stuff that's happening at the big tech companies, that is something that's happening right now to all those companies. The moment they announce something big is happening in AI, they have like a huge increase in market value because this is how the market sees it. Um, AI is seen as a providing shareholder value and it's something that's really important for you to to provide um, to stay competitive in the future so this is something that i also don't want to sound alarmist but i want to so, um, maybe show a little bit that the realist situation will be that the moment and this is you've seen it in the past with every new technology the moment you have a new technology that creates uh more efficiency and thus a greater value that can be extracted from a process where before value was captured in a certain kind of structure, very rarely do these gains trickle down the chain. So it's very rarely, even though there were some voices here that sounded a little bit optimistic, um, very rarely was it that, hey, we have a great, uh, we have a great way of distributing uh, movies and TVs via streaming. There's a lot of value to be captured in or freed by um, going around certain structures that were in place for, for three or four or five decades. While this will definitely work in favor of the writers and producers and the people involved on a, on, a, on a lower level of this. No, most of the time this value goes up the chain. And this is also, um, I know this sounds alarmist, but this is something bear in mind that AI is a technology that's, that will free a lot of um, value from, from certain structures. And I think it's um, the, the, the mission or should, could be the mission of everyone involved to be very well informed what it means when such a technology is applied. What does it mean for you, for your work, for your um, work as a future in the industry um, to make informed decisions and maybe say, hey, I don't think that the way this is used right now by company XY um, is the right way. I think we should maybe do something. And here I find it interesting that even though the strong unions in the US um, in the last few months at least tried to raise a ruckus that what came out in the end as a compromise um, sounds a little bit lukewarm and not exactly aiming at the problems that we will be facing in the future. I hope that is not too too dark of a, of a tangent to go into our next talk. Um, for that talk, um, we have here Johanna Kolionen, um, and maybe I heard she's already in the stream, so maybe we head over to her. Yeah, and I'll change microphones and place it. Hi, Johanna. Hi, can you hear me all right? I can hear you very good, very well. Uh, we have a slight echo going, but I think it's gone in a second. Um, I give a quick, I gave a quick introduction. Um, I heard a fair amount. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I also heard a fair amount of your of your intro now, which is fascinating. And I already disagree a little bit on some points. So this is going to be great fun. Um, maybe um, talk a little bit about. Um, what you're doing, um, you are one of the brains behind the Nostradamus report, um, a report that I can only, anyone working in the, in the film industry, in the TV industry, I can only recommend that you um, bookmark because it appears yearly and it is, for a lot of people, the holy bible of what will happen in the industry in the next few months or years. And I think there is, in my opinion, uh, no one out there right now who has a better overview over the current state of the industry and the, and the future state of the industry um, than, um, than Johanna. So I'm very glad that you can join us here. Thank you. You said that you ha already have a point of contention with with what I say. I'm really cu curious. Um, maybe we can <laughs> we can pick it up right there. Well, sure. I was just thinking. You mentioned in passing, and I mean, I didn't hear exactly everything you said, but you mentioned some of these uh, AI films that are already out there, uh, and 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 were being funny about the Wes Anderson uh, aesthetic. Um, 
And it turns out that a number of those uh, those trailers, at least two of them, are made by the same person. Uh, his name is uh, Caleb Ward. And I had the, the privilege, actually, of, of having him as a speaker at an event at the Film Institute in Stockholm last week. And somebody in the audience asked a very intelligent question, which is, well, how does it feel for you as a filmmaker when when this when your work goes viral and everybody says AI created it? And he says, well, honestly, <laughs> it doesn't feel great. So I think it's, there is something very interesting, in, interesting narratively or sort of in the fact that, that whether you are for or against AI, already we have decided, we, have, we are speaking about it. Even we who are in the film industry are saying, oh, AI created this trailer. Now, if you look at the trailer of, of AI, Lord of the Rings or, or AI, Star Wars, uh, th these kinds of, you know, Wes Anderson, Star Lord of the Rings, for instance, I think that one was made in about, I can't remember now what he said, six hours or a day or something like that, noodling around in his on his porch. So it's the fascinating thing, of course, is that it can be created so fast at such a quality with the relatively simple tools that are currently available. But what, I, what AI video doesn't do today, for instance, is multi-shot sequences. So, so even though you can, there are you can you can use even today AI in many elements of putting together a piece of film, even a comedy trailer or a satirical trailer. But there is a great amount of human work still that goes into not just prompting it, but also editing it, um, uh, you know, doing panning on still images and and uh, or do, using a, a bunch of techniques to make it seem as though film, uh, film is being generated by the AI. Of course, the film is being generated still, the storytelling is still being generated by humans. Um, and that's where we are today. And I think it's really important to say that because there is a distinction that we need to be able to keep in mind, I think, between how this technology will go on the consumer side and how it will go on the professional side. Um, so filmmakers will be using these technologies to make film and uh, normal people who are not yet filmmakers, although some of them perhaps will be one day, but most, you know, just like I, I use a camera every hour probably, but I'm not a photographer. Uh, similarly, video generation will be available to normal people like myself who are not filmmakers. Um, but that doesn't mean that I am then a filmmaker or that the AI necessarily is a filmmaker, even if the if the tools develop further. Um, I think this is a great point to definitely come back to in um, a little bit towards the end, because I think that the line that was also a topic here yesterday that blurring this line between the professional um, and the, the the creator that comes from an amateur level, that this line might get more blurred and that there's a lot of um, democratization happening, even though yesterday even the word democratization was, um, was argued here. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think it might be very interesting and that what, what I found so interesting when we talked last time, um, that you say that a lot of these changes happening through AI are happening in an industry and in a situation where a lot of factors come together on a global scale in terms of things that don't even automatically have something to do with, with our industry. And on an industry level where a lot of um, changes that have been slapped upon um, are um, suddenly rearing their head. Um, is this mm -hmm. kind of a perfect storm brewing right now for the industry or is this too strong of an image? No, I think it's a perfect storm. And is it is it okay if I talk a little bit about this background just the last 10 years? Yeah, so I think everybody who's who's sort of been, I mean, and especially I know this is a very mixed audience, so like 10 years ago, some of you may have been quite young, but but those of you who are, let's say, middle-aged producers of like my generation or or older, we grew up with a film industry, of course, that, that looked very different and we're financing and distributing a piece of a specific form of content, like a feature film or a TV show. Largely, that used to happen in like one way. There was there was more or less one way that that financing could happen, and there was more or less one path uh, that distribution could take. And they all looked like largely uh, similar always. And the first sort of huge revolution that hit us all was, of course, the, the digitization of the whole film value chain. So, so it's not just streaming; it's that every part of the process from from 
you know, I mean, like I said, an early example of that when everybody started to write screenplays in screenwriting in film in, in screenplay software. Um, and that start that also is a kind of digitization that made certain formal things easier uh, for for film for for screenwriters. And in every step of the way, we have the level of digital tools has has been been rising, and that of course ultimately came through also in in distribution. We digitized the, our cinemas, we digitized the, the distribution of film, we digitized the distribution to our living rooms, and it's good to remember now that basically all, like I think already a majority of TV sets, certainly in the US, I think also in Europe, and and every new TV set that is sold is a smart TV, so it's connected to the internet and the interfacing bit to content in on a television now of course is not really channels even it's apps and then you can also have channels but technically those are also streaming so all of that is streaming now and last year uh, i think we finally saw the big breakthrough of virtual production becoming accessible also to 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 people in uh, to filmmakers in europe for instance and other places and that in itself is such an enormous digital revolution that it's uh, it's astonishing that that um, we haven't that we can have something coming now that's bigger. So basically, everything about how we make films and how we distribute them and how they are consumed has actually changed in the last decade or or so, decade and change. You know, you can also say maybe twenty years if you want to go all the way back to like the beginning of YouTube and and so on. But our industry has not radically changed. Of course, you know, if you're in sales and distribution, you've probably like switched your business model up or down the value chain and so on. But and if you were only making feature films, probably you expanded into into TV series and vice versa, for instance. So it, there was some level of diversification of the slate. But I think we were able as an industry, even in Europe, we were able to continue in a pretty conservative and similar way as before. We changed slightly, but we had a situation of enormous artificial demand. And what I mean by that is that a lot of money for production came into the system, into our market, our ecosystems in the last decade. And it came from two sources, primarily, of course, like one of the big ones, of course, was streaming. Um, so so that the the big streamers and also the small streamers that, you know, are maybe only in one European country or in a few European countries, all of them were trying to to grow based on debt. So it was very cheap to, to borrow money in the marketplace. And, and it was possible to finance uh, your competition by making a lot of content with money you hadn't earned yet, basically. And that was the business model for all of them. And it's good to remember that even to this day, I think Netflix is the only streaming service that is actually profitable, that has been managed, managed to reach a break-even point financially. And everybody else is operating on debt. And that's unsustainable, of course, as we have seen. Um, but at the same time, there was also a lot of money coming in from production incentives of different kinds. A lot of different countries and regions were putting were putting dangling money in front of producers to to make to to lure producers to them, and that was new money entering the ecosystem, uh, boosting budgets absolutely, but also boosting pr production. So we had this very sort of financially artificial boom in in the last five years when we've been making enormous record amounts of film and tv series which wasn't based on suddenly the audience wanting to watch more hours or to watch specifically those that content it was based on the fact that money was available for production and then we would produce the things that we were able to get financed because that's our job i think on the production side so so now in the last year, then what's happened when the market has corrected for all kinds of macroeconomic reasons primarily and said, oh, hang on, <laughs> you know, like we can't, this money isn't free anymore. You'll need to show a pass, path to profitability. And and the big um, the big sort of um, streamers are, and, and also just broadcasters are cutting down on commissions for all kinds of reasons like inflation. Now, suddenly we are seeing, oh, hang on, <laughs> uh, this wasn't, real like that demand wasn't real so if your business plan has been to continue working at whatever level you were working at just before the pandemic that's not feasible that, that that's not a market that existed then and we don't know where the total number of, of like what's a quote-unquote natural number for for film and tv dramas 
But a lot of smart people are saying probably about half of where it was at the peak. And that's probably true, sort of like with some local variations across um, across markets. So I think, I mean, I don't know the German numbers, but I'm just going to guess. I'm totally guessing now, but I'm totally guessing that if you make as many films, if you make half of the number of films and TV shows that you made in 2019, you're probably still making significantly more than you made in, in the year 2000, for instance. So it's not necessarily like a historical crisis. It's just that compared to a few years of like blinding light, uh, it's, it's going to look bad. But of course, that in itself is going to have effects on the on the market on the whole area of filmmaking on our whole industry and those effects are essentially that it's the effects of the digitization that are happening now belatedly they should have happened some years ago but they essentially only sort of are coming through in now and in the next few years and on top of that which is kind of already a crisis in the sense of that it's a dramatic change and and that it might leave you know some it's going to leave some structural um uh, changes or possibly damage and certainly probably some unemployment in its wake on top of that now is happening this whole ai revolution and that is concerning it's a concerning combination because i don't think we were ready for the previous revolution which already is kind of 10 years old and that makes me think that we as an industry are maybe not great at looking ahead at what's happening next um this is um yeah, this is a good point to that. Uh, we might be good at making maybe um, science fiction movies and series, but um, to actually prepare for the kind of future that, that's looming, it might be difficult. Um, if you look at some of the, you now have for the last, for the last year, um, AI, I, th I can imagine, has strongly informed the topics that we are talking about, that you were, the, the panels that you were hosting. Um, if you had to, um, to find like something like a red thread that was showing through in terms of what is the topic, what would the direction be that we could prepare better as a as an industry or that you can prepare better as maybe also as an individual. Um, do you think there's also already something showing where you say this is something that you can hone in on? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two ways of approaching that question. One is to that it's 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 not helpful at this point to hope that ai tools are going to go away because clearly they're not going to go away so so if you're a creative uh, of any kind you need to familiarize yourself with what's available and and then there's some practical advice for instance if you are using the free chat gpt version and you are allowing that to sort of form your idea of what is possible or how big of a change this is going to be. You need to actually try and chain, pay for, you know, GPT-4, which is the sort of next generation, which already isn't the most cutting edge, but it's so significantly better than, than chat GPT. So you need to, you, you need to, let's see that if I get, I, correct me, Gerhard, if I'm getting the versions wrong, but basically you should pay for chat GPT so you know how good it is today. So that's like one piece of very practical advice. Um, and of course, that's if you're a producer or a writer, if you're a filmmaker, maybe, you know, similarly with the visual tools, try and find what's the most cutting edge tool that is available to you and just play around with that to get some idea of what we're talking about in a sort of practical sense and what it could mean for you creatively. But a, a totally different way of approaching this is to say, okay, but like, what is the change of the digital film industry? Like, what is the change that we have missed in the last several years. And I think that, well, I think a way of thinking about it is basically this, that we were promised um, that the digital, the digital filmmaking, the digitization of filmmaking would have a democratizing effect. And I, I know this is a problematic word. Let's talk about that separately in a little while. We said it will change everything. It will change power relations. It will, um, it will make it possible to produce professional quality film and video content um, outside the traditional structures of, 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 our, of the film and television industries. And that has actually largely come true. It's come true only marginally in the field of fiction. Uh, it's come through only marginally in the field of professional documentary. Um, it's come through to a slightly higher degree in the field of animation. And uh, also like, yeah, fiction, animation, uh, also for adults. Um, and then it's come through enormously powerfully in almost every other type of content that we used to see on, on 
television. I'm saying quote unquote television because it's so difficult not to define what is even television. But what I used to think of as television when I was growing up and I'm 45, most of that content actually now, apart from fiction and sports essentially, is also being produced at professional levels in outside the traditional structures uh, that we are all part of. And I think that's a huge blind spot for our industry because it's because we're general, generally not part of it. But a number that really sort of astonished me for it with the work for this year's report is that what's called the um, the creator, the creator industry, the creator sector um, of of what we would consider to be non-professional um, creators making video content among other other media is now at 100 billion, which puts it at par sort of with video games. It's certainly bigger than, than the film industry. And and then it's really important to understand that the 100, mi million, 100 billion dollar industry, sorry, 100 billion dollar industry is not an amateur industry. A 100 billion dollar industry with 20 years, you know, with a 20 year history is full of professionals who are working in professional ways, in professional companies with professional support structures and and they have professional teams of professional editors and publicists and all of the sort of kind of support structures that are happening also uh, in filmmaking are absolutely already available in sort of this kind of other kind of video content. And that's so important and that is so inspiring because it means that there are even today already totally different ways of making and funding content that are absolutely available to to filmmakers. Um, and, and that means that if, I mean, we haven't needed because we have, we were being paid to do it the old way. So we haven't needed to explore this. So our producers as a rule are incredibly unknowledgeable about how serious some of these other paths are. Uh, and we also, I think it's, unfortunately, we had this idea for like maybe five, 10 years ago, there was this period when we, people were talking a lot about crowdfunding and crew funding and, and these kinds of like other uh, financing methods. And then it was very difficult to scale to what a feature film cost. And then at that point, people said, well, it's never going to work. And it's really important to remember that just because something isn't working today, it doesn't mean that the model is broken fundamentally. Uh, so, so if we are looking at a future, which is totally possible, where the cost of filmmaking will radically drop for all kinds of reasons, including just that the digital tools that are, are, have already been established for the last decade are just becoming cheaper constantly, then just working directly with your audience is a totally viable path. And this connects to another problem, which is that we are, we as an industry, the traditional industry, are finding it really difficult to connect to younger audiences, by which I mean uh, Gen Z and, and Gen Alpha, basically, so the under 26. We are increasingly less or decreasingly relevant to, to them. Um, and it's not because they are doing something wrong, like you can't blame the audience. That's a stupid approach. Don't ever do that. And if you're working for older people who are blaming the audience, you should like back away slowly and go work somewhere else uh, because they're not going to get it. If you're if the audience is, is being on the wrong platforms and watching the wrong content, uh, that means that we as an industry have, have failed the audience. We are unable to create content that is relevant in voices that are relevant and feel truthful and artistically interesting to this audience. Um, because actually young people do watch films and TV shows, tons of them, over and over and over. So if our local content isn't connecting, then we're just not making content that is relevant. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're also not attracting young talent. And this is an awful thing to, do, to say when I know that there are a lot of young filmmakers in the audience. I hope that you're all uh, sort of a, both really well connected to your own generations and uh, and also to sort of the tradition and, and the language of, of cinema, because I think those two deserve to be connected. There are things that that people are that the audiences are losing out on when they are unable to connect uh, with the audience. But I don't think there's any kind of rule that says young people don't like art house cinema, for instance, or young people are uninterested in auteur cinema. That's nonsense. You can just go on Film Talk, and you will find that there's an enormous passionate interest for like really good artistic storytelling. Uh, it's just that the younger generations have other pathways into that. They're not going to go to a video store or a cinematheque necessarily to to be 
taught film history, so that has to come somewhere else. But if you're interested in film history, that means you're also interested in really good filmmaking that is coming out in in your own age. Um, so, so I think that essentially there are like real possibilities, and it's the the scary thing here, kind of, is that that the industry has changed to a place where there is now room for, there's much more potential for more diverse storytelling. There's um, an interest within our industry for diverse voices and for younger voices. But somehow we came to that so late that we have kind of lost a generation of the audience and we're going to have to earn their attention back film by film, you know, TV show by TV show, episode by episode. Um, And if we do that, then... Again, like then this is the positive view. Then all of these other escalating changes that are happening fundamentally will not ruin the film industry because the film industry is sustainable as long as it has an audience, basically. And everything else is ultimately just about what tools we are we are using. Um when when hearing this and hearing this connection also maybe to um between younger generations, younger audiences that are lost for certain kind of, of programming right now and um, its connection to also certain platforms. And that means not only those platforms, but the companies behind those platforms. Yeah. Um, do you think, I think the, the last, the latest numbers is uh, projections for next year uh, for TikTok um, of, uh, uh, of earnings in the term of $24 billion. Um, dollars. And I think uh, there was a, um, a recent survey with um, um I know American, but American teenagers, um, and two thirds of them said that they would rather use access to all streaming than you losing access to TikTok. And I think this yeah. um, shows a little bit a power structure that is um, not exactly in favor of the of the of the of the structure of the industry that we're in right now. One hundred percent, but also. I mean, also, let's be real, social media, all of them, and in particular, uh, TikTok is also like a dopamine, like addiction machine as well. It's also a brilliantly designed product. And I mean, brilliant in the most awful sense of the world. It's a horrible death trap for our brains. Like I can't, I would be happy to use TikTok, but I cannot because I can't control it. Like I know in, I know myself so well that I know that I, I don't. Like people with ADD should not be allowed on TikTok essentially. So I cannot have it installed on my phone because it I would just lose hours every day. But is that, you know, I mean, is that the end of the world in the sense of of like what we're talking about for our industry? Well, I mean, yeah, it is more addictive than a lot of the other things, but but 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm the first generation who got to go on Facebook when we were at university. And that was also a, a, a time sink. Like, or like how many hours a day at some point when Twitter was a thing? Like, how much time did I spend on Twitter? And that's not, that time wasn't competing, I think, with my watching movies necessarily. It was competing with other things. It was it's competing with reading newspapers and it's competing with watching linear television. And I think when I was a teenager, there was always, always a television on in the background, whether I was watching it or not. And it's that was probably also considered to be like a horrible thing by grown-ups at that time. So it's also important not to just like moral panic because young people are using other media than than we did at the time. I mean, Jesus Christ, I guess you're also more or less of the age gap where like MTV, which used to, once to be a television channel that only showed music videos, Uh, when that was introduced, and there's a huge moral panic about like what's uh, you know our grades are going to drop because we're watching MTV all the time. It's like no, that didn't happen, and we got really into into film. So so uh, people who use TikTok aren't idiots. Obviously, they understand that different media are good at different things, and they will absolutely watch a film as well when they are interested enough to do it. But what younger generations, in fact, every generation, zero people in the world today have a need to watch like filler content. You know, I have watched in my day so many like kind of shit American comedy shows on television because that's what that was the best thing. That was the best thing that was on offer. There was nothing better there. So now if that TV was on, I would, of course, prefer to like if I had that kind of time to sit in front in front of a TV, I would watch like only good stuff that was interesting to me and good and meaningful because there's no re- need to watch crap except except when you are hooked by a recommendation algorithm to 
to not make active choices when you are watching the next thing that Netflix is offering you or the next clip that TikTok is offering you or, or whatever, then yes, then there's a kind of addiction behavior there. Um, but that doesn't mean that we intellectually aren't interested in well-curated content that actually fits our needs. So I'm a little bit less alarmist, I think, than that. But I mean, should there be art house storytelling on TikTok, whatever that means? Like, I don't know what that means. Somebody who is native to that platform needs to tell me what is what is like what would art house TikTok be like? Like what would relevant local content, relevant fiction content, relevant film culture content be on TikTok? Uh it's it's quite possibly already there. And if we're not engaging with it as an industry, we're not doing our job. Um, I think you're pointing in a direction that I find really interesting. And in the last few um and yesterday we were talking a little bit about this. Um, this change from curation AI to generative AI. Um, but what you're mentioning is pointing a little bit in this direction that um, already curation AI is influencing very heavily how what kind of stories we, we watch and what we do with our time. And I think it's interesting that seeing that, I think it was Meta in its last earnings report, uh, one of the biggest points um, that you are raising is that their new algorithm for suggestion, suggestion AI algorithm um, for Instagram is like driving engagement up 24%. This means before when you spend an, an hour on, on Instagram, now through the new recommendation curation AI, you spend 24 minutes more. I think the, um, this like puts certain kind of non-curation AI driven forms of storytelling as a mm -hmm. disadvantage, it seems. And it, I think the, the second point that you made is like this um, Netflix playing something new for you just um, because it's the curation AI things that, that, you, that you want to see it. Um, it also seems to, at least in the experience um, of, of myself and some of the studies um, su support it very strongly, um, you're being pushed into a certain kind of bubble um, that it's very hard to, to break out of, that it's very hard to see um, things that you haven't seen before and um, go into directions that you haven't seen before. I think that's absolutely true. I think anyone who lives in a household with more than like two adults or more can just go into each other. This is fun experiments, go into each other's Netflix profiles and just see what content they think that person should be watching, like just between like the members of my family, they're like completely different services. So that's absolutely part of it as well. But but I, I think that that's just, that's just the landscape. Like we've had similar problems historically. We were always griping similarly about the Hollywood studios and about how their just marketing dominance made it very difficult to compete, relatively speaking, with the attention or the, the if we thought that, you know, even when people went to the movies all the time, very few few people saw more than one movie a week. Um, and that movie was very often by a, by a major studio, uh, by a major Hollywood studio. And, and that was also difficult to compete with, yet we have been able to maintain a very sort of uh, strong, if not entirely sustainable, at least like a very sort of lively uh, film industry in, in Europe. And to me, like this, this is what it comes down to. Like, I'm, I worry that I'm going to sound like some kind of tech, like evangelist. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like a total public film funding nerd. And like, I want, I'm really invested in like public service media and art house film. And I, I just really want a sustainable film industry in Europe, but it's incredibly, and, and I mean, sustainable, artistically sustainable, you know, financially sustainable. Um, and also environmentally sustainable, of course, like we don't have any choice about that at this point. Um, I want all of those things to be true. But I think that if we are not very realistic about the size of the changes that have already happened and that are about to happen uh, and and realistic about about the possibilities as, as well as the, the threats, then I think we're in big trouble. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of threats, this is something that um, yesterday came up here, but unfortunately at the panel, they didn't dive um, much deeper into it, um, that some of the numbers coming right now from um, from um, economic analysts um, in the US are a little bit, I don't want to say frightening, but um, at least disturbing that I think the um, Goldman Sachs study is from May this year. And um, by May, it said that the current state of the generative AI industry um, is already cutting down 300 million jobs worldwide. And mostly, most of them coming from 
people with a higher education. So it's not hitting people yeah. who do manual labor, but people who studied five, six, seven, eight years to, to get their job. Um, similar studies exist in the EU for the last, I think, since 2018, where it's about what the impact of AI will mean on the on the workforce in Europe. And I think the numbers there are that about half of the jobs in the next um until end of the of the decade will be under threat to go serious changes or be um will will be lost completely um yeah. some of this um hitting us here in the in the film industry it seems like that we're only looking at a small piece of the of a la much larger puzzle that might come come to haunt us in in one way or another yeah, I, I, I will speak to that and I will then say that let's just do the whole bad news at the same time. I mean, obviously, uh, anybody who lived through last summer, you know, and was paying attention, uh, know now that we are we have also passed. We, we're in a very new uh, situation with the climate crisis as well, uh, where the, the we are, you know, we're doing a lot of, of actions, but it's very important that we don't get lulled into the belief that we just because it looks like we may possibly be able to sort of slow down global warming slightly, that that means we're safe. We're absolutely not safe because it's also we are also learning that the sort of systemic effects, you know, the extreme weather and the possible tipping points, even which would be the like which there are a number of systemic effects that can happen to the climate that. We don't when if they would happen, it would take much more than centuries to fix, and we don't know where those are. Uh, but the current science is now pointing to the fact that they might be closer than we thought. That is to say, we can't afford to go. The, the, we maybe cannot afford uh, a much higher temperature because even dealing with the effects of the of the climate change that has already happened, like even if we went to zero today, uh, the effects are actually in some ways worse than than we thought. So that means that for all of us, you know, for every person on this planet, the rest of our life is going to be relatively hard to terrifyingly, off, awfully hard. Uh, climate change means more crises and more disasters in every country, also in, 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 in countries uh, like Germany or, or Sweden, for instance, or, you know, uh, we, we have seen catastrophic flooding events, for instance, and forest fires, these kinds of things. And, and just on an incredibly practical level, if you shoot outdoors, it, you know, you need to think about it. Like you need to care about this. You can't, you can't isolate your work in the film industry from climate change because good luck shooting outdoors if, you know, um, the whole, like, like now there were forest fires in Canada and the whole eastern sort of seaboard of the United States was, it wasn't possible to go out for, for like weeks. You know, you're not going to shoot outside if that's the situation anywhere close to where you are. Ah, but you can shoot in your virtual production, you know, rig, yeah, maybe, unless there's a flood. So, you know, and, and that's assuming that we have energy. All of these things are going to be much more difficult. And then we are having this. So just that means also increased migration, of course, increased wars, um, instability in the global food system. That's going to be the rest of our lives. So, so it's always going to be something like we're never going to go back into like a really peaceful period when everything is fine. And this means that public attention and, and public finances are going to be needed. Public money is going to be needed uh, sometimes to solve urgent crises, which mean in ways that means that, that our funding can disappear. It also means that populists are likely to win elections. Um, Already, like just the the climate stuff and all of the social changes that come from that are mean that, and you come. I mean, the, in 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 countries that teach history, uh, which unfortunately isn't every country, but I mean, I don't need to tell you what happens when a lot of middle class people start losing their jobs at the same time. So we're moving into something pretty scary, and and I think that if there's no unpolitical way to talk about this, whatever your politics are, like this is a time to get organized because we're going to need a lot of solutions here. And in just incredibly crass terms, like even if you're just, you don't care about society, you just care about business, our audience as filmmakers is the middle class. Like we need a peaceful, relatively stable, relatively affluent middle class to have a market for art and entertainment because that's who the sort of core audience for arts and entertainment is and especially for the sort of artsier side of it for sociological reasons. And if that stuff is undermined, then our audience will have other things on their mind uh, and less time probably to just 
you know, veg out and, and watch content um, or to go out and, and have like a fantastic experience in movie theater. And that in itself is something that we should be alarmed about. Like this is this is the reality that we're going to be operating in for the rest of my life. I mean, I, like I'm a parent. I don't love that this is real. Uh, and I would prefer, I mean, many hours a day, I am able to not think about this personally, but but then I have to like force myself to go back and just remember that this is the reality. And like every decision that we make, every business decision that we make and every personal decision that we make, and certainly every political like voting decision, for instance, that we make, we have to take into account that this is the reality of the world in which we live now. Um, and, and when we're looking in detail at wars that have happened, I'm not going to speak to the wars maybe that are, you know, have just erupted. It's too soon to say uh, anything about that, except what a horrible, tragic situation. Horrible. Um, you know, a lot of wars like ultimately tend to be about natural resources. So that also uh, is something that is changing us and changing our audiences is like we're going to live in an age with more violence we who were privileged enough to grow up in a in a relatively peaceful time and how does that change our stories and how does that change from a sort of humanist perspective who we are and what the purpose of of what we do as storytellers is so these are enormous massive questions and this is the landscape then where if we are you know, if the experts are right, and let's assume that the experts are right, let's hope that they're wrong, but let's assume that they are right. A lot of middle class jobs are going to get automated away um, in the next, you know, decade. So the good news about that is it's not just us. I said before, the bad news is that it's not just us, because like if, if it affects our audiences, economics, that always affects our industry as well. But the good news, of course, in a really practical sense is that it's not just us, because it's going to be more like the pandemic. Like we're going to need to have in Europe, we're going to have some kind of government structures need to be put into place to catch people who lose their jobs, because it's just going to be so many people. Uh, so, so that like, it's this is this, I mean, in the United States, I would be horrified if I was in a middle class job and about to lose it, because it could literally mean that I might be homeless, you know, next year. Whereas in Europe, at least in 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 our countries, we have the we are in a situation where there's the relative safety of knowing that we don't have to let fear control all of our decisions. We are unlikely to starve uh, if we as middle class people lose our our jobs. Um, but I mean, yeah, this is incredibly, this is incredibly dire. I wish I wouldn't have to talk about this, but it's important to understand that, like, and especially when we get outraged and when we talk about, like, you know, I, I as an artist, am outraged that I am being asked whether I would like to use this tool or not. Like that's, yeah, like that outrage is real, and I understand it, and and which connects to, like, especially when we have strong identities connected to our um, jobs. If you're a lawyer or a journalist or a filmmaker. These are not just jobs, right? They're, they're identities as well. And if that job is taken away from you or you're afraid that it's going to be taken away from you, that's a profound fear that is really real and should be heard out and should be respected. Um, but I think that the, the, way, the way, the direction to go with this fear is to, to look forward and to be very strategic and to organize. Ha, huh, that's because you said another thing, Gary, before that I disagreed with a little bit. You said historically when new efficiencies have happened in industries, the value hasn't gone to the workers, it's always gone to capital. And that's true. But there's, and that's certainly been true in streaming, right? Uh, but there, there are historical examples of, of that not being true, or, or, or of the opposite being true. And that is that in sectors where, st with strong unions, yeah. uh, strong unions have in industrial contexts been able to fight for 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 getting just better work situations for you know in in structural changes and i think that's the big lesson to take away here also from actually from the from the american strikes which are specific to the american context but we need to understand that that individual like this isn't going to be solved on like your level as an individual artist or like your production company making better choices like you we all need to be very smart but we also in addition need to organize and we need to work through our our artistic guilds and our unions and on in our national levels and on on the european level for constructive 
reg regulation, for copyright protections, for all of those things that we need to be able to survive urgently as an industry. A, a really important one, of course, for actors, but also for just everybody. We don't have legal protection of our likeness in Europe right now. There's just a hole in legislation. So, I, I mean, there are some, depending on which country you're in, for instance, you can't use my face for advertising, but you can use it in other ways legally. And we need to stop that. You know, that needs to be patched up right now. And I think if you're an actor or working with actors, this is one issue. Like it's a very practical issue where, where organizing for change would be, you know, you have a possibility to get real results. Do you think that uh, some of the changes you're you're talking about, and especially this, um, I see it completely the same way. I think that organizing and um, informing yourself and then organizing and making organized um, collective decisions in which path do we think would be good to take as uh, as a society as an industry is um, is enormously important but um it at which background at which timeline do you think this is this is rele uh, relevant because or is could be happening because right now it's seeing some of the <laughs> development happening so fast that um even for us as someone investing a lot of time and staying at, on top of developments um it's very easy to feel like left behind. Do you think there's time to make informed yeah. decisions as an industry, as a society, in a time frame where we can make this change happen? Well, I mean, I don't know, but if the alternative is to give up, then obviously we're gonna lose. So like, we don't really have a choice, right? It's just, if we don't do this, then the interests of the, of the biggest companies will win. And this has to, like everything, everything about how our, in, our industry works. Like I've been, you know, if you go and download our this report, I, I've been lecturing about this for years, it feels like in every part, the step of this change, when we don't act systematically and st strategically, then of course, you know, the biggest companies will always win. So from that perspective, it, it doesn't really matter if we have time or not. Every action that we don't take is going to make the ultimate outcome worse. It's, it's in that sense, it's like climate change, right? Like it's, a lot of climate change has already happened. Uh, but now it's about, is it going to be just bad or is it going to be unlivably bad, right? So so I think this is a little bit similar. And the timelines, uh, I'm happy you asked, um, and I also am scared to talk about this a little bit because, so what I said in May, when the latest Nostradamus report came out, it was released in in, uh, in Cannes and, and we just finished editing it like two weeks before maybe. Um, we said everything, every job essentially in the film industry is going to change on like a three to five year horizon that we have. Uh, every job is going to change and some of them are going to disappear. And and I remember thinking then like, well, is this a little bit of like, is it too soon? Because it's also like when techn new technologies, um, pop, you know, emerge, actually it takes time for them to sort of um, filter through systems because humans have to learn skills uh, and replace all skills and the new technologies need to be stable and you need to be able to trust that they will work when you need them in a professional setting. And you will need to know, like, for instance, I think if you're a filmmaker and if you're a film student and you're one, you're learning, you know, if you're just playing around with these tools, you know, to, to learn about them, great, no big deal. But if you're like in a professional setting making films and you're using AI tools, you need to be damn sure that the AI tools that you're using are ethical. So already there, you may feel very reasonably, and like, I'm not going to say, you know, what your opinion should be, but like, there are a lot of reasonable people who feel that, that using these models that are trained on on, on content that is just scraped off the internet is in itself not particularly ethical that that's that you are that it's an, that you're contributing to um to very sort of harmful effects on a lot of creative industries and in, in particular like illustration is is being hit very hard and very rapidly um, and similarly like you want to make sure if you work with synthetic voices or synthetic you know images of any kind but with synthetic voices for instance you you want to make sure like uh, is the tool I'm using um, is it, are they ethical in how they are using, for instance, if I'm using this tool and my actors are using this tool, do they, are their voices used to train that tool further? Or am I using it sort of in, in a sort of local instance? You need to be able to educate yourself enough to be able to ask these kinds of questions. Like what, how is my data, whose data am I using basically? 
and what is happening to my data. You need to always know the answers to these to these questions. And if you can't find the answers in a believable way on the website of the service, then don't use the service professional. Like that's a good starting starting point. And even with the professional tools, like we need to to ask about this. And now we went on a massive aside, and I feel like I lost track of where we were going. The timeline, right? Um, okay. So, so on last week. Uh, I had different speakers uh, that I, I was speaking with in this seminar, and three of them were people who are working in Hollywood with the, these kinds of tools. Uh, and one was a virtual production supervisor for for um, just Hollywood blockbusters and for like Netflix's Fallout, these kinds of things, big productions. And the others um, were yeah Caleb and, and Shelby Ward who are using these tools to work with. Uh, already with big studios and already with, uh, with um, and within as independent filmmakers with independent filmmakers as well, uh, and then we had a speaker called Sten Saluver, who is this very knowledgeable person who runs, among many other things, he runs the next program uh, at Cannes, which is their sort of future, the Marché du Film's future-facing program, and irrespective of each other, without having coordinated, both Caleb and Shelby and Sten uh, were showing kind of the same slides. They were saying, here is the timeline that the sort of venture capitalists have announced that they believe in for AI technologies, for multimodal AI, so the picture, text, uh, audio, how fast that's going to go. And here's what we now think is the real timeline. And you need to understand that venture capitalists are like the hype men of Silicon Valley. Like it's kind of their job to say, oh, this is a huge thing. Like we're putting all this money. We're going to put other people's money and our money into this thing because it's going to be huge. And part of doing that is helping the things become huge. So when their timelines are too slow, then it's going really fast. And what these people were irrespective of each other saying, saying, they said, well, if you look at, if the timelines keep for when the next versions of these central tools are going to come out, we might be just 36 months away from being able to kind of skip. And I mean, I'm summarizing, they didn't use these exact words, but they said, basically, we might be 30, 36 months away from being able to generate professional film quality uh, video sequences, film sequences. Um, that would that is to say, you would be able to generate prompt based a film sequence that would be photorealistic if that's what you want, or in, you know lit in the way that you want, with consistent performances from the actors uh, and multi shot uh, sequences, so you can do like here's a dog's running through and this the room and these people are reacting and this thing is falling down like which currently ai isn't even close to being able to do but in 36 months what if they can and even if maybe the performances aren't great of course we all still have all of those other uh, technologies so it's now trivial to replace a person with uh, like an, you could replace the sort of generated character with an actual real world performance from re from a, from a real actor that you um, captured in different ways. So the, because of course those technologies, all the virtual production tools are also coming faster. And just something, some, some things about this are fantastic. You make a film and then you need to do pickups, you know, or you need to do reshoots. We, we haven't historically been able to afford a lot of reshoots in Europe to be real. And now we can, and that's huge. Or, or like we've seen in very expensive films a few times, these examples where an actor kind of gets cancelled because there turns out that they're a criminal, for instance, and you don't want them in your film anymore. Well, it's been a huge problem. Or when Henry Cavill was uh, working on another project and he had to do reshoots for Superman, but he had a mustache that he was contractually obliged to not shave off. And they had to go in, you know, frame by frame and remove his mustache. All of that stuff is just like a, a, a press of a button now. But... So like there, even a really practical level for everyone in filmmaking, in every step of like pre-production, pre-visualization is going to be fantastic. A lot of the sort of post, what used to be post-production work is going to be part of your previous now. Um, your shooting is going to be, especially if you're using hybrid forms with, with physical and virtual production forms and, and you're using AI to generate uh, your digital assets, for instance, fantastic. Or you can just generate certain parts. Maybe you generate your establishing shots or certain scenes entirely. Or you generate your whole film sort of scene by scene. This is both fantastic and terrifying 
So if you're an art house filmmaker who already is working with, like you have a really specific artistic voice, you would do everything yourself if you could. Well, now you can do everything yourself. You're, you have, you're a filmmaker, you're, there are certain types of projects that you cannot get funded. Like we don't have a huge, like, I mean, I feel like we don't have an enormous amount of like, let's say German language, science fiction, like action epics, for instance. I don't think it's because your markets don't love them. I think it's because it's just been too expensive. Like Finland, where I'm from, we have not produced a huge number of like visual effects heavy features, for instance. Uh, that's going to be available. But in the process of that becoming a choice, so like now, we, what if 36 months from now, which is nothing, 36 months from now, some of you are just out of film school. Now, maybe it's a choice. How do you, do you use a cinematographer at all? And when you do, do you use a physical camera or a virtual camera? Is this, how do you work with, how do we work with prompting? Like between a director and a cinematographer, like, cause, cause the skill sets, the storytelling skill sets are still going to exist, but the way we put, the way we take an empty space where perhaps we used to build a set with carpenters and we, physical actors and things like this and to, to generate the surface that we could then film that we had lit in a specific way. Now getting that effect maybe is possible with a totally different path of production. It's still going to be artistically, you know, if you want to control what's in the image, you're still going to have to control what's in the image. But if that's possible 36 months from now, I don't see how that wouldn't affect you know, the labor market for a lot of jobs in this industry, because some people will choose to not use every human skill set that historically they would have needed. And some people will choose not to do it because they couldn't have afforded them anyway. And some people will use choose not to do it because for artistic reasons, and some people will choose not to do it because they will be forced by the changing price structure around the industry to not do it the most expensive way when it's possible to do cheaper. Uh, and this is where, why it's so important that we start to think about like, okay, but how would we like this to work? And I think a, a good, like, I mean, a, a lot of people were, if you remember, if you were around then, you will remember that when we started shooting, shooting on digital, a lot of people said like, no, I will make all of my films on film, on physical film forever. And very few people do that today because the benefits of digital outweigh the benefits of film, which are real. Uh, tactility, for instance, uh, certain types of visual effects. But if you can get the exact same look without using those tools or with some other method, it would also be kind of artistically responsible to not consider using those methods, especially if your work is funded with public money. Like I, I, I do think that we, that we who are in sectors that have such a you know a high level of pub public funding, we do need to think about: is it possible for us to? to do the same thing in an ethical way, but with lower cost. Of course, we're going to have to consider using these tools. Um, and if we don't, other people will. And there's something there, there that's terrifying. Like 36 months is not... Yeah. I mean, 36, it's if you plan a project today, like if you start developing a project today, this is we're going to have a lot of confusion in the marketplace because how do you budget a project that's going to shoot two years from now? Like, what's the price of anything going to be? What's the cost of anything going to be? What's the value of anything going to be? What technologies are going to be available to you? It's anybody's guess. And even if they're wrong, like, well, because let's say it's not 36 months. Let's say it's 10 years. But <laughs> even if they're massively wrong and it takes 13 years instead of three years, you know, it's still really soon when it comes to the ways that we have made film historically and the way that they've been funded and distributed. Um, two, two of the factors or two of the scenarios that you, you sketched out a little bit, um, one of them would mean, um, it sounds a little bit like the, the death knell for the studios, for the big Hollywood studios, because um, if anyone in their, in their cellar or basement can do uh, movies that are on, on the level, um, on the visual level of blockbusters in, in certain ways, and imagining that you can, don't know, for a certain fee, by the face render of a famous actor just to put into your movie, um, then suddenly the only thing that 
Hollywood has really ga- going for it. It's it's marketing machine that is, as we've seen this summer in the in the cinemas here in Germany, is already stuttering with a lot of um, big franchises underperforming. Um, yeah. At the yeah. Same oh time, God. Yeah. And at the same time, um, the 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 it it seems that if everybody's able to create and you have like this creator economy also not only going for social media content but for much bigger larger projects um it feels like we have this deluge of content rolling towards us that it's it seems like we already are drowning in series and movies so it Mm. feels like that this will just accelerate that you will will have a lot more out there and it seems to elevate the 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 gatekeeper um role of the big tech companies um, who decide what will actually show up on your stream what will actually yeah. be able um, to, to make it through to the audience actually the job of every gatekeeper is going to be a goddamn nightmare yeah because actually you know the the skill set of applying for funds for a film is very different from the skill set of actually like making the film that you're promising to make in the application. So already there, it's difficult. So if if it becomes easier, if you get even better tools to to become better at applying for money from funders or to you know for, from your investors or whatever it is, that process of understanding can you deliver is going to be hard. If you're a programmer for a film festival, just imagine the number of films that will be submitted. To every film festival, every number of scripts. Like I, I, it's weird. I think it's probably because I'm I'm originally a writer and I'm a lit major. So I think like writing a good film script, writing writing like generating a superficially good or writing with AI support, a superficially good film script. I think is going to be relatively easy, but a really good film script is probably going to be very hard. But there are people whose job it is to read. Even today, everybody's you know scripts and piles of scripts like physical you know they're using them as door stoppers at the agencies like it's it's already it has been for a long time impossible to read all the scripts that are submitted to people so on, in one way like it's going to be anti-democratic because the networks like who you know who can vouch for your skill set how you are able to prove what you already can do is going to be even more important so if you're already established in the film industry actually i think you're going to have a leg up on the other hand if you already can bring an audience, and this has been important, increasingly important for the last decades, like, it, you know, it, actors with a big Instagram following are more likely to become, um, to get cast, for instance, because they can support the, the film in their channels. So similarly, if, as a filmmaker, if you have proved yourself being able to make content that resonates with audiences, that is going to make you more believable as a, as somebody who can deliver on what you're promising to deliver but if if we just if you can untease a little bit and i know we don't have a ton of time but just to untease a little bit this idea of like democratization i think it means a bunch of different things like yes there are going to be consumer facing products like we have you know dolly and chatgpt and this today where you can kind of prompt film content and it's going to make some something for you that's going to be pretty good and sometimes depending on how original your prompt is like maybe even super original because of like it's surprising elements being combined and yeah we're going to have like endless amounts of that content it's going to be everywhere but of course we're also going to be sort of like that's only going to be fascinating for so long so we can assume that there are some level or some mechanisms or indeed some ai tools that are going to help the best stuff rise to the surface so let's assume that the sort of recommendation uh, works uh, especially human recommendation would work like i mean there was a lot of posts were posted on reddit but they reddit had like a pretty good system for for upvoting things that are genuinely relevant. So let's imagine that that's solved, um, even though it's a, it's not a small problem. Then who makes the content? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the professionals are definitely going to like continue making content because it's our job. And some things that have been difficult for us to make before are going to be easier to make. So that's one kind of democratization is that between where there have historically been power imbalances that have to do with access to money primarily, those are probably going to be evened out. That means the US has had a benefit over Europe. Europe will catch up. Global North, Global South, Global South probably will catch up. Film and television, television can catch up. Like access to, for instance, certain kinds of visual styles have been too expensive. 
and now they are suddenly going to be available. I'm fascinated to see what the kind of art house filmmakers, you know, the people who's, you know, a festival filmmakers, con filmmakers, these kinds of people uh, in the art house who are who have the qualities of an art house storyteller, what they can do when they are unlimited by um, budgetary restraints when it comes to visual content. I, I'm fascinated. Like I think that's going to be artistically super interesting. Similarly, young filmmakers versus old filmmakers. We haven't traditionally trusted somebody who just came out of film school with a very large budget, even though maybe for their artistic voice, making an expensive film like an action movie would have been a better choice for a first feature than making whatever is possible for them financially. Uh, so that there, there also it's possible to 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 see um, democratization in the sense that people who haven't for different reasons or people who haven't had access to the film schools, people who are like intel incredibly talented storytellers, but for socioeconomic reasons or because of structural injustice or whatever it is, it hasn't been possible for them to 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 take this to get into the school and to then be very poor and work for free for so many years that it takes to establish yourself in the industry. Now, maybe there's a path to kind of make a living, churn out a living while making actual film until you build your audience and you're able to break into the industry that way. That also is democratization, and that doesn't make film worse at all. So there's the democratization that is everybody will be able to generate video. And then there is the democratization that says that film artists will be less limited in what is possible to them visually. Uh, what is possible to imagine is perhaps now possible also to visualize. Uh, and that's going to generate some fantastic film. It's probably also going to generate some pretty awful films. Like I am not, for instance, a huge like Zack Snyder fan. Like I'm not a huge Michael Bay fan. There are people who have access to enormous budgets and an enormous visual imagination who I don't think are using them in ways that are like the best, even for like, I love action movies and superhero movies, but I feel like sometimes somebody should tell these dudes that the emperor has no clothes, that would be helpful, or like that a film needs to end or whatever, you know, or it, a plot needs to make sense. And I think if it's possible today for some people to make like incredibly visual films that are kind of crap, you know, that's absolutely 100% going to happen on every level as well. And so, so, but the, like the weird thing about that is, that I think the value of a film education from the perspective of like as an investment in being able to tell great film stories, whether you choose to do, do it with these tools or other tools, is probably going to be greater than ever. And that cannot, like there is a democratization that's between like an amateur and a professional or an, and somebody who doesn't understand film as a medium or film who doesn't know film history, for instance, and somebody who does. And that democratization is not constructive. Like that, I don't think that's a very useful thing to have, except that, in, you know, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily a great development. And I certainly don't think that just like every random person making short films is necessarily going to make those short films any good because people, you know, who have tried to make short films know how difficult it is to make a short film that actually like means something to people um, and to break through. So being in, 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 from this perspective, you can also say that if you're in film school right now, you are learning the principles, like the underlying tools to be ready for the most exciting time in the history of cinema, probably to be in this industry. And if you're in, if you're a producer today, you need to learn, you need to start thinking very seriously about if we just invented the whole film industry today, we didn't have all of these funding structures and distribution platform, you know, historical distribution models and so on. How would you, we find, fund and distribute mov movies today if we had to invent it today? And to just start working proactively in that way to protect yourself uh, from, you know, in parallel with the old ways, to protect yourself from what's coming. Uh, so from that perspective, I, I think it's a pretty cool time to be in film. Yeah. I think this is a wonderful note to, to end upon. Um, and I hope that um, that this uh, resonates um, here, here a little bit with the audience. Uh, Johanna, thank you so much for your, for your valuable insights. Thank you so much for your time. And um, hope very thank much you. to um, talk to you again latest 
um, in Göteborg or in Zerenkamp next year. Um, thank you so much again. It's been my, It's pleasure. Been my pleasure. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much. And I think this is the perfect note to also end this um, two-day symposium. Um, I think one of the one of the questions, or one of the little bit meter questions that ran a little bit through um, in the background, and I think that might be interesting to explore, but more interesting to explore for you as artists, producers, writers, directors, um, is the one that we posed in the beginning this how does this change our spiritual and mental landscape what does this changes in tools in um, storytelling styles in the visual language in what we can do and who we can produce it for um does with the way that we look at the world and that we interact with the world around us um i hope that The last two days could give you some inspiration, some insights, um, maybe a lot of new information. Um, I want to um, thank you for taking part in it. I want to take uh, thank Michael for trusting the process once again, uh, which was uh, this year a bumpier ride than than last year uh, for whatever reasons. Um, I want to thank uh, very much um, the the technical team um, up there who made it all happen. Thanks, you guys. Um, thanks here to the Film Academy of um, of giving us a stage an opportunity to to try out some stuff that's a little bit more crazy than what you might say, see at another film festival. And most of all, thanks to you for staying with us, staying interested, and being part of this. Thanks. <laughs>